Hello, I'm Dr. Matthew Jorgensen, a board-certified toxicologist and physical chemist working with Nielsen Laboratories. Today, we will be talking about biocompatibility evaluation for medical device IDE submissions. Essentially, this is a crash course overview of medical device biocompatibility. We'll talk about the expectations the FDA has regarding biocompatibility prior to initiation of a clinical trial, and then we'll provide a brief overview of the tests and evaluations that go into that. Really, there's so much that we could talk about here. We regularly give seminars on this topic that last several days, and we are going to just condense the highlights of that into a very brief 30 minutes. Before I get too far into that, let me just give you a personal introduction. So my background is in chemistry. I have a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Utah, where I focused on photonic nanomaterials. The emphasis of my work historically has been in theoretical physics, especially quantum mechanics and, and photonics. And I also have a healthy background of uh, analytical chemistry. Since joining Nelson Labs, uh, my focus has been on medical device biocompatibility, especially toxicological risk assessment and analytical alter alternatives to animal testing and toxicology. But my one main claim to fame is uh, in relation to Mountain Dew. So uh, that is the uh, Mountain Dew Whiteout that you see on your screen there. It's a flavor of Mountain Dew that I helped to create back in the day, actually while I was in graduate school. And for that reason, and because I, I consume quite a lot of Mountain Dew, folks tend to call me Dr. Dew, and you all are welcome to refer to me that way if you wish. So first of all, what is biocompatibility? So uh, I like to reference the Hippocratic Oath, which we often think of as saying, first, do no harm, uh, although that's technically not in the Hippocratic Oath. The, the main objective of medicine is to improve patient health. Doctors need devices that actually help their patients, not, not harm them. And the burden is on device manufacturers to ensure that their devices don't cause any adverse biological effects. So it's not enough to, to demonstrate that the device works as intended. You also need to demonstrate that the device doesn't cause unintended negative consequences. And the, the, the scope and range of those unintended negative consequences run the gamut. Uh, but, you know, thankfully we have standards that have helped to, to try to consolidate the main negative biological effects that can happen when a person interacts with a medical device and those have been tabulated in this standard so uh, what you see on your screen here is table a1 from iso 10993-1 this is the the overarching international guidance on medical device biocompatibility evaluation and you can see that depending on the nature of device contact different biological risks need to be evaluated and, and uh, mitigated. And so the FDA takes this table very seriously. And as you uh, go to apply uh, for an IDE and you, you want to begin your clinical trial, you'll need to, depending on the type of device that you have, show that each of those uh, risks are mitigated. So for example, if your new device is, let's say, a heart stent, then that would be something that's in uh, circulating blood, uh, and it would be considered an external, uh, externally communicating medical device. And usually something like a nitinol stent will remain in the body forever. So that, that's something that would be, in this category, external communicating medical device circulating blood, C, long term for greater than 30 days. And you can see there that there's uh, an X for physical and or chemical information and then a bunch of E's that indicate that each of those different biological endpoints need to be evaluated. So just to be clear, and I know that, you know, we're just going to go over this really, really quickly. Uh, an X is really considered a requirement uh, and it's thought of as a prerequisite to actually performing biological tests that are, that are in that row. Um, and then the, the E is indicating that that biological risk needs to be evaluated either with testing or with scientific rationale. So we shouldn't um, get into the, the habit of thinking that at any time that there's a biological risk that that needs to be tested to be evaluated. Really, when we use a risk-based and scientific approach, a lot of these uh, endpoints can be evaluated without using a biological test. 
So if I, uh, you know, line these up, if you have something like uh, a stent, then these are the endpoints that would be required for evaluation. You can see there's, uh, you know, many of them there, cytotoxicity, sensitization, irritation, and so on and so forth. And uh, of this set, there's a subset that the FDA will accept analytical chemistry and a toxicological risk assessment for. That would be these ones, acute systemic, subacute, subchronic, chronic, genotoxicity, and carcinogenicity. So all of those uh, shown in green, the FDA will accept chemistry and uh, a toxicological risk assessment. The other ones really require uh, a biological test to demonstrate that those aren't a risk or other special scientific rationale, you know, not, not chemistry, to, to show that that is um, – that those risks are mitigated. And, and when we look at these systemic toxicities, I said that the FDA will accept chemistry and uh, toxicological risk assessment. There also are options to evaluate those without doing any testing. Uh, and then, of course, there are traditional biological tests that can be used to address those. However, I would like, I, I drew a, a dash line there to the traditional biological tests because that's really becoming less and less common over time. People uh, are uh, you know, taking the 3R seriously, the the ISO standard 10993-2, which is the very next standard after dash one, obviously, um, is all about mitigating uh, needless animal tests, and so so we want to avoid these traditional biological tests as much as as possible. So now I'm just going to briefly go in and we'll talk about a few of these in vitro and in vivo animal tests, and then we'll talk a little bit about chemistry and toxicological risk assessment after that to cover some of these evaluations. So when you have a medical device and, and you're approaching this problem, how do we show or prove to the FDA that it's biocompatible? And you start to go down this path through ISO 10993-1, um, you'll see that there's this whole process to the way that medical devices are thought of in this context. So, so first of all, one key idea is that when we qualify a medical device, a lot of this evaluation is based on or, or trying to root out potential concerns with the manufacturing and processing of materials rather than the materials themselves. So for example, there are many, many silicone implants out there, and a lot of people will claim the same grade of silicone uh, for their implant. But the way that they handle that silicone, the types of containers it in, the, it's in, the way it's sterilized and packaged can all have a very big impact on whether or not that device is, is safe. And so we, we think about it as a materials and process, from a materials and processing perspective, um, and we really are looking for these types of residuals. And, and for that reason, the medical device is often uh, extracted and handled on a, a surface area normalized basis. And so and all of these like parameters for how that sample preparation takes place is in, in ISO 10993-12, but essentially think about it this way, that, that all medical devices that have cytotox, uh, sensitization, and irritation testing, we, all, we always use the same amount of extraction fluid per surface area. The, the device is soaked or chopped up and then soaked in this, this fluid and then whatever came off of the device goes into the fluid and that fluid is exposed to, to whatever system, right? So that's why here, uh, in the case of, of cytotoxicity testing, which I'm, which I'm talking about next, the, the device is soaked in um, minimal essential media fluid. So this is a growth media for, for cells at a ratio of 120 centimeters squared um, uh, in, is in total for, for about 80 mils of solution. And uh, it, it's soaked there, chemicals come off the device, and then we expose living cells to to that, that media. And we see, did that uh, did anything leave the device that could actually harm the cells or, or cause them to die? And, and this is the, the, the basis of a cytotoxicity test. Uh, so you can see what this is like, you know, they're soaked. We apply that uh, MEM fluid to the, the materials. Of course, we have positive and negative controls that go into this to make sure that the test is running correctly. And if everything works out well, uh, then there's nothing that can harm or kill cells that leave the, the device. And you would get a score of zero, which is negative for cytotoxicity. And this is what a, uh, 
uh, microscope image of those cells would look like if they're they're all very happy. Uh, and uh, this is what a four looks like if it's positive for cytotoxicity and and we're really killing almost all of them. So and, and the way that these scores are applied, it's a little bit subjective, right? So this uh, that there are rules to grading, but uh, this isn't like a fully quantitative measurement. It's something that uh, an analyst is trained to do, and then they score these uh, plates under the microscope according to the guidelines that, that you see here, right? So, so that's the, the first hurdle. Cytotoxicity testing is super duper common in the world of medical device biocompatibility. We do it day in and day out, really on, on all devices, um, to check for anything that might come off that could be you know, potentially toxic to, to cells. Now that said, you can imagine if, if we keep on uh, thinking about a, uh, 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 let's say a nitinol heart stent, then there are cases like the, like nitinol that we know are going to be cytotoxic. So, so just because a device fails cytotoxicity doesn't mean that it can't receive IEE approval. It's more that, uh, you know, we need to note that cytotoxicity didn't pass, and then there's additional scientific explanation and justification to defend why that um, failing result is is acceptable and isn't, you know, correlated to an unacceptable uh, risk from the perspective of patient safety. Okay, the the other test that's uh, this is a, an in vivo test that basically all medical devices have to, to go through is sensitization tests. So essentially we are soaking the device in, in saline and cottonseed oil and seeing if there's anything that leaves the device that can cause an allergic reaction. There's a couple of different ways that this can be done. Guinea pig maximization is definitely the way that the, uh, that the FDA uh, prefers. Uh, certainly as you approach these types of studies, uh, you know, of course, since it's a sensitization reaction, multiple doses uh, to the animal over uh, separate time points are are necessary to observe that type of effect. So naturally, this involves some some turnaround time, uh, and and it's often the longest uh, pull in the tent when it comes to to timelines for for devices that uh, are more straightforward. So so for non-implant devices. Okay, so uh, another in vivo test that's uh, that's basically always required is, is irritation. So this is primary skin irritation. We are looking to see if there's anything that leaves the device that can cause uh, 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 inflammation of the skin. Uh, and depending on where the device will be used, we can we can do this in a site uh, specific manner. The way that the test works is that we extract the device in uh, saline and cottonseed oil. 50 degrees C for 72 hours. And then those uh, extracts are, if it's intracutaneous, they're, they're injected into five sites on each animal. We have, of course, samples and controls. And uh, if there's inflammation and redness, then that means that there was an irritant there and uh, the, the, uh, the test would fail. Now, again, so, so cytotoxicity test is a, an in vitro test, super common, uh, and it's also the most likely to, to fail. Uh, so I would say, you know, maybe it fails like one out of 10 times or one out of 100 times. The, um, the sensitization and irritation testing, uh, these are in vivo tests. So in, in uh, guinea pigs and uh, rabbits, and they you know, they are much less likely to fail. It's more like one out of 10,000 times. So it's really rare that we have a sensitization or an irritation reaction that we don't uh, predict or we couldn't have predicted ahead of actually performing the test. So it's good to keep that in mind that, that the, the hurdle to get over is actually usually cytotoxicity testing because it's just so, so sensitive. Sensitization and irritation uh, usually we don't have any surprises there when it comes to these uh, these types of tests. Okay, so what about all of the rest of those systemic toxicities? And, and now we're going to get to a little bit of chemistry, which is, of course, my uh, my most favorite part, uh, being a chemist myself. And, and usually I, I talk about this in the context of, of an actual medical device. So that's what you see here, this, uh, this 3D printed uh, Spock hand. 
is intended to be implanted permanently in the body next to the heart so that you can keep the, the memory of Leonard Nimoy with you always. And, and so if you were this Star Trek fan that was going to have this implanted, or if you were the FDA and you know, you're screening this for a clinical trial and somebody's going to do chemistry to try to understand uh, what could be there that might cause toxicological effects, what would you look for? And, and the answer is that we need to look for anything. Really, this is a type of unbounded chemistry problem where we'll, we'll soak a device in, in a polar, a midpolar, and a nonpolar solution. Usually that's water, isopropanol, and, and hexane. And then we need to screen those extract solutions for anything that could have left. And, and this kind of makes it a special problem. So we're looking for metals that can leave the plastic that, you know, there's catalysts and, and other sorts of additives, you know, production oils and residuals, plastic uh, has other additives like uh, DHP, plasticizers or Urquinox 1010, these antioxidants and so on. Um, and, and it's like a super wide net looking for, for all of that stuff. And you can imagine this is a kind of an involved process to do it uh, correctly. We screen for absolutely as many different things as we can while trying to um, avoid getting caught up in uh, very, very specific subgroups of compounds that are, you know, super challenging to look for. So for example, if we have a uh, titanium knee, we would do, we would look for all of these compounds that you see there in green, you know, volatiles, semi-volatiles, and so on. Uh, but, but we wouldn't really look for biologics on, you know, coming from the surface of a titanium knee, things like that. Uh, so, so we search for everything. Uh, a key question to this whole problem, and if you are ever faced with this, this issue where you're, you're attempting to do chemistry testing to uh, perform a toxicological risk assessment for a medical device, I, I really strongly suggest that you seek out the, the help and advice of, of an expert as you approach that, because there's lots of variables that are really, really important to the FDA. One variable that's super duper important is, is how sensitive this analysis is. So you can imagine it's really easy to say, oh yeah, we screened for everything, but with a if you didn't use a good sensitivity, that's it's not that that hard, right? And it's not surprising that you don't find anything if you have not a good sensitivity. So the FDA uh, really requires a specific type of sensitivity. This is based on what we call the threshold of toxicological concern, or TTC. Uh, this is a, a dose-based threshold for which, uh, regardless of what the identity of a chemical is, if it's below the TTC, uh, we would consider it to not not be concerning or or even having the potential of causing uh, cancer at all, right? And and the way that this level was developed was uh, toxicologists took chemicals that were the most nasty and the, the absolutely most toxic, things like positive controls for cancer studies, and they said, okay, well, how safe would it be to be exposed to this positive control for cancer studies? And then they divided that by a big safety factor, like a thousand, you know? And so it's like a super duper duper conservative level uh, where you say, okay, really, Whatever it is, if it's you know below one and a half micrograms per day, we don't care uh, even to look 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 lower. And for the for the FDA, this is really a, a good measure of how sensitive a chemistry study should be. So it should be so sensitive that we know that anything that was missed below the threshold of sensitivity wouldn't be concerning. It's so it makes sense to to be sensitive down to something like a, a TTC. So you do this chemistry analysis. You screen for everything that you can think of, and what you get is this, uh, you know, long, big table of results where you have all of these chemical components and how much was uh, leaving the device in terms of micrograms per device or micrograms per device per day. And then the question is, well, what do you do? Uh, how do you interpret that? And uh, the answer is that uh, a toxicologist needs to, you know, take that data, digest it, and uh, the, the output is, uh, is a toxicological risk assessment where the toxicologist says, and, the, and they sign their name to it, this amount of glue component one is, uh, is acceptable. Or, you know, if, you know, something's unacceptable, then that will be indicated in the toxicological risk assessment as well. And, and so um, this leads me to just my, 
my one slide introduction to toxicology and really how this all fits together. So, so the field of toxicology seeks an answer to a fundamental question. How much of a good thing is too much? And I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I like to drink a lot of Mountain Dew. Uh, I, I drink so much now that if I had none, then that would probably produce some adverse effects in, in me, right? And, and when we think about how much of a good thing is too much, we often consider things like the route of exposure and duration and uh, the different types of negative outcomes that could happen. And so you can imagine if you think about the amount of caffeine that I have uh, per day uh, versus what types of adverse things can happen, you might see a curve like this. It's, it's a little bit like a U-shaped curve where if the amount of caffeine is zero, then of course we have something like irritability. Uh, we have this homeostasis or a minimum where it's, I guess we could call this my, my new normal. And then with increasing and increasing amounts of caffeine, then we start to layer in uh, potential adverse uh, effects like arrhythmia and tremors. Uh, once you get going, you know, a little bit higher, you have hallucinations. And then there's a point there, we would call it uh, uh, an effective dose 50, right, for, for a particular type of event where there's a 50% chance of something bad happening or, or something happening, or in this case, a 50% chance of death. So that would be a, a lethal dose 50 is right there. And then, of course, uh, eventually this has to plateau, right? So there's an amount of caffeine where it's basically guaranteed to, to kill, uh, you know, any, any living system. And then above that, it's, it's flat, right? So there's no, you know, no more increase above 100% of, of killing, killing all of them. So, so in the case of caffeine, you know, this is about 150 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, that the, the human body is standardized according to ISO 10993 1 is, is weighing 70 kilograms for an adult male. So that's about uh, 10 and a half grams of caffeine or uh, 95 Red Bulls to reach that, um, that plateau there. Uh, normally though, the, these types of dose response curves look a little bit more like this, like an S-shaped curve where you have all of these doses uh, up to a point where there's this highest dose where nothing bad was ever observed to happen. And that's the, the no observed uh, adverse effect level in Noel. So, so anything down there is, is a case where doses, we have evidence that this was given to an animal system or to humans or, or whatever the system was, and nothing happened. So these are generally considered to be pretty safe amounts. And then just above the no well is you have the, the low well. So that's the lowest observed adverse effect level. So that's the first lowest dose where something bad did happen. Then of course you have a dose where something happened 50% of the time and, and then the maximum response. And so really what we're trying to do with medical device toxicology is we take this data, or the data that's input to the tox assessment is this chemistry data produced in a very meticulous way. And then compound by compound, we ask ourselves, okay, you know, is this above some clearly accepted uh, dose base threshold? And if it is, then, then we start to look in the toxicological literature and we say, okay, can we find, you know, some dose response curves for this compound? Uh, with this same route of exposure, and where on this curve would it would it fall? And and usually what we're finding is that these compounds are being detected way 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 low on the scale, uh, far below the Noel. And so what we're doing is we're taking the Noel, and there's a whole prescription for uh, how you should apply a Noel that was found in an animal study to a threshold that you're going to use in humans. Uh, and that's in another ISO standard, 10993-17. And we follow that formula and derive a threshold to try to show that everything that was coming off of the medical device is below a threshold that's uh, sufficiently conservative. Okay, and, and, and based off of this analysis, we'll make conclusions on subacute, subchronic, genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, um, and, and also acute tox, uh, acute toxicity. So that, that basically, that analysis takes care of all of those biological endpoints to, uh, to, to wrap it up. Now, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about the ideal flow for this entire process, because there is, uh, I think, truly a, a right way and a, a less right way to, to approach this. So I, I would say the moment that you know that you're participating, you know, with a device that is intended to go to a clinical trial 
or also the, I would say the same um, flow applies if perchance you're contributing or working with a device that's going for clearance through, through a different regulatory pathway like a 510k, then, then really there, there should be a good flow to this to avoid like serious problems down the road, both with the FDA and with the folks that are doing your testing and, and tox assessments and so on. So what, before this, any of this evaluation should begin, the design of the device should be locked completely and ready to prepare for the submission. So it sounds like a no brainer, but actually it happens all the time where people will start this biocompatibility evaluation process for their clinical trial. And then two months into it, uh, an engineer will say, oh, well, wait, we really should change this adhesive from adhesive A to adhesive B. And uh, if they do that, if they make that change, then that means likely they'll have to do all of the testing over again because it can be really hard to you know, prove that this switch from adhesive A to adhesive B isn't going to change the outcome or the conclusion of this bio uh, biocompatibility evaluation. So, so super important, the device design should be locked prior to, to starting on this path. And when I say the design of the device, I, I don't mean just the device itself, but all of the processing and that includes uh, packaging and sterilization. So if it's a sterile device, it needs to be known how it will be packaged and sterilized. Okay, so after all of this is locked down, then there really should be the formulation of a discrete biological evaluation plan. And it's, again, it seems really straightforward, but you'd be surprised at how often it doesn't happen that folks start barreling down this path, the path of biocompatibility, which involves a lot of really expensive tests and, and time, and they don't start down that path with a fan, with a plan in place first, right? And and the reason why this is important is sometimes people will, will start down this path. They'll order, you know, chemistry and toxicological risk assessment, only to find out at the end that that really chemistry and a toxicological risk assessment wasn't necessary, and, and maybe can't even help them at, at all. So it's really kind of like sad when that happens. Or if they they start down this path and and are trying to evaluate the wrong. Uh, endpoints because they've classified the device wrong. That can also be pretty pretty painful. Um, the next step is that you know before chemistry testing begins, uh, really a toxicologist should be consulted. So knowledge of what the correct threshold of toxicological concern is is absolutely critical to ensure that the chemistry study is not either under or over sensitive. So being too sensitive can also be a problem. And, and then knowledge of where this device is going. I, I know here uh, we often think about IDE submissions, uh, you know, for the FDA, but for clinical trials or other types of submissions anywhere in the world, it can really make a difference who the audience for this biocompatibility evaluation is and who, you know, what regulatory body will be reviewing these results. Uh, that can have a big impact on how the study is done. But, but absolutely critical is knowing before you start testing, how sensitive does that testing need to be? Because that, that's the type of thing that can cause somebody to have to start over way down the line. Then once that's the toxicologist is consulted and everything is known about how sensitive it should be, then and only then is passed on to a lab for testing, uh, informed by all of this information from the toxicologist. The chemistry lab does their thing and, and then passes the data back to to the toxicologist who performs an evaluation, like, like I explained. And then finally, all of this data is wrapped together and summarized in one overarching document. We usually call that document a biological evaluation report. Uh, it just says what the device is, why it's being, uh, you know, submitted for IDE, and uh, what the biological risks were or, or how they were defined per 10993-1, the outcome of all the tests, and then the, the conclusion that the device is indeed biocompatible and isn't going to cause undue harm to patients when uh, when use as intended. Okay, well, with that, uh, I think that that is about it's about time. Um, I, I really really love talking about this stuff. I'd be happy to carry on for hours and hours or days. <laughs> uh, please, uh, if you do have any interest or feel like you know, chatting about biocompatibility or clinical trial submissions, uh, 
feel free to uh, to email me. My email is there at the, the top of the screen there with any questions that you might have. And with that, I will close and, and just say thank you for your attention and time today.